Nice, looking good with that haircut. All right, Dad, today is uh, Monday, May 27th, um, and I thought we could start uh, today by talking a little bit about the situation in Ukraine. So um, basically what I've been hearing is that when Secretary Antony Blinken went to Kiev, he had a pretty somber experience. You know, he played his little song in the, the basement of a, of a bar, but overall the message was that we're losing this war and we need to do something fast. And now he's come back to the United States and seems to be pushing kind of what Victoria Newland was saying, that we need to allow Ukraine to strike within Russia. Um, right. And it sounds like the drums of war are starting to beat louder within the United States to escalate this situation. We've been giving attackums and high Mars. Um, and there's this, it looks like that we are going to green light Ukraine to use our weaponry to attack within Russia itself, which this is something that I, we can maybe talk about a bit because Ukraine has already been shelling civilian infrastructure within Russia and the Belgorod region. Right. Uh, so it, how big of an escalation is this? Is this just kind of a little bit more extreme? These were using more advanced right. weaponry that have longer range. They could strike deeper. Like, how serious is this? Because I think a lot of people that listen yeah. may just be like, well, it's war. What do you expect? You know, so. Well, it is an escalation. But like you say, you know, it's. Um, we've already take some, taken some steps in that direction. Um, yeah, we have, yeah, there's no question that Ukraine has been shelling um, uh, villages, towns, cities in the, the regions to the north of it. These, you know, these are all Russia, you know, according to, you know, to, to everyone, you know, this is Russia pre-2014. Right. This is not some recently occupied territory. It's always been Russia. Um, but we've shelled it. And, you know, there there have been these awful missile strikes on the city of Belgorod. Um, my understanding is that most of those are carried out by uh, vampire uh, missiles that are provided by Czechoslovakia. So they are NATO provided, you know, but not U.S. provided. Now, the, the shells, those are coming from all the all all over the place. Um, but then there are also these incursions, right? These attacks on uh, border villages by those okay, uh, Russian volunteered so-called, you know, um, uh, units, and they used American equipment. You know, there's no question about it. You know, they used um, Bradleys and, and other um, American vehicles. Um, and I believe there have also been HIMARS strikes. You know, I might be wrong about that. And and HIMARS, um, again, that's a, that's U.S. supplied. Um, so it's not like this hasn't happened. I guess the escalation would be that, okay, give the permission to use the attackants, which can go farther and maybe do more damage. Um, and that's, like you say, that's what Blinken has been openly advocating for since his trip to Kiev. Yeah, I guess that he, like you said, he, it was a sobering experience for him. He heard, he, he got a sense about how desperate the situation is. And then uh, for the Ukrainians and then Zelensky as an excuse for the success of the the Russian incursion into the Kharkov region, you know, said that, well, you know, what do you expect? We couldn't strike their, you know, their, um, their ammunition depots and their supply lines and so forth. And that's, you know, we, we, we wanted to do it, but you didn't let us, I, you know, I have trouble believing, believing that. I think that they, you know, they obviously didn't prepare for this. They had well over a year to prepare defensive fortifications. They didn't do it. Um, yeah. I think it was just part of general incompetence, but it was, he seized on it as a, you know, as a way of uh, applying more pressure you know, to, again, to allow him to escalate first, further. I, again, you know, it's just like the, they have, they've done all kinds of things that supposedly they're not supposed to, like these terrorist attacks that the Ukrainians have carried out, you know, the, the assassinations. Um, there's no question that they carried them out. The U.S. Is, has kind of wrung their hands about that and said, oh, we told them not to do it. But of course, they continue to, to support them. So, you know, it's always been something of a charade that that they're really under constraints. 
Um, so it's hard to say how much of an escalation it is. You know, maybe the the U.S. was saying, "Okay, well, oh, you've done this and that and the other thing. You know, we'll look the other way, but don't use the attack arms." And now they're um, now there's a move to to lift that that constraint officially. Now that would be a major escalation, just in general. You know, to point out that um, you know there have like during all through the Cold War. The first Cold War, we'll say, you know, between the Soviet Union and the U.S., there are all kinds of proxy wars, but there there was one red line that they never crossed. He said, "Okay, we can we'll support the proxies that are maybe fighting your troops." So we may, for example, we uh, supplied arms to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, and they use those arms to kill Russian soldiers. Uh, but but or or during the Vietnam War, you know, the the Soviets. Uh, su supported North Vietnam and the Viet Cong, and who ended up killing American soldiers. But there was there was never an instance where um, you know guns were supplied, weapons were supplied, or, which were used to strike within the the territory of you know the opposing power. That never happened, and that was understood that that was you know forbidden. We don't do that. You know this is and. The, it's already started to happen, and and uh, you know Biden, or we should say Blinken, has his way. This escalation, you know, that will become official and open, and um, even you so know, is even that more the, deadly than it has been. Is is that the big big difference then? Is that this is just sort of a public policy admission from the United States that yeah, we are now attacking Russia using our weapons using our guidance, you know, um, under our direction that they're going to be doing this, even though we're kind right. of already doing it on a smaller level, but it's not, we've always said that don't do this, but it's right, happening right. anyway. Like every time, like the Ukrainians would do it, there would be something, there would be a leak to the New York Times, for example, you know, in which you say, oh, you know, we're very upset that the Ukrainians did this. So there was this plausible, you know, deniability, say, um, yeah, so that would be a big difference. And I guess maybe also just the firepower. I mean, the attack them, sir, it can, can wreak more destruction than the other, uh, weapons that have been used. You, you were saying that Zelensky was, uh, upset saying like, this is the Kharkov invasion. This is because you didn't let us strike the, their military outposts across the border, their munitions depots, these types of things. But They've been striking using artillery shells, like these vampire missiles, like you said, right. to hit civilian targets. Why right, were they never right. targeting the military targets? Yeah, it seems like that's they a very used... good question. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. It seems like they specifically right. try to target civilian infrastructure. They haven't been really targeting military infrastructure. Is that because right. the military infrastructure is out of the range of the vampire missiles or 105 no, millimeter shells? The would be true. You know, I mean, if you're talking, if there's an imminent invasion, that means that the forces have been brought up to the border, right? They're going to be even in closer range. You know, Belgorod is is not very far from the border, but it's certainly farther away from where you know these troops were were massed prior prior to the the invasion or the incursion. Then um, why 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 not yeah, well, target yeah, that? That's a good, yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, and why didn't they build any fortifications? Right? You know, one thing they said I, later is they says, well, you know, we couldn't because you know we was too close to the border and they were firing upon it. There actually has been. Uh, video that came out very recently showing the, the Russians um, actually setting up, digging, you know, trenches, setting up fortifications very close to the current, you know, uh, line of contact. You know, again, there's there, the, the, the two main battles are occurring in these two villages. Uh, one's Lipsy and the other one is uh, Volchansk. And very intense battles, but very close to these battles, the Russians are right now, you know, digging fortifications as it looks so, like they're, so, uh, you know, clearly it can be done. They just didn't do it. And again, they had, you know, they had months in which, you know, everybody knew that this was coming. We, we talked about it, you know, even in the weeks leading up to it, it looks like there's going to be, you know, an invasion of Kharkov. Um, it's been in the, you know, it's been in the media for a while. And they had in any case, ever since like the September roughly of 2022 they've had control over the area and you would think that it, they would have wanted to begin building fortifications they had you know close to two years to do this they didn't do it so it's just 
it's a combination of incompetence and corruption and just madness. Like you say, these civilian attacks, they don't make any sense. It's just, you know, it's just pure viciousness, let's be honest. I mean, these strikes against, you know, civilian targets, you know, both in Belgorod, but also, you know, in the Donetsk, you know, the, the shelling of Donetsk. You, you're complaining about your lack of shells or high Mars and whatever, and you, you strike, you know, you, you strike a kindergarten or a market or whatever, and you do it again and again. It's not a mistake. You know, what is that all about? I mean, that's just sort of, it's, it's demented. Is it because maybe that's the only thing that they can you know, strike that they that they're not able to attack the the military well, bases because there's air defense, or yeah. it still doesn't well, make any sense. Yeah. Like it doesn't make any sense because, um, you know, the the there always are military targets. You know, they may be harder to hit; they're better defended. But but even you know, like if the high Mars, uh, most of them are are um, are intercepted or diverted by. Um, by Russia's electronic warfare, but still, you know, occasionally something gets through. And if you're fighting a real war, you just, you know, you try and try again, you go after the military targets and occasionally they do hit them. I mean, they've had successes just over the course of the whole war, you know, occasionally hitting. It's not every day or even every week, but they will occasionally hit a, a, a depot or, you know, some sort of... Um, logistical installation or something so it's not like they don't do it at all but they clearly waste of you know a lot of their weaponry in just terrorizing civilians so there's at least an element you know a pretty powerful element in the uh the ukrainian army that is more concerned with just just killing russians as they see them i think it's very re revealing you know they they claim these regions uh you know uh, eastern don the donbass you know as being Part of Ukraine, but they clearly don't uh, respect to have you know any regard for the lives of the people who live there. They they see them as Russians and traitors, and they just think that they you know they're uh, justified in killing them. It's it's hard to look at it any other way. It just seems like such a, a bad tactical strategical yeah. decision, though. You just right. I mean, right? Like, even, even if, if your that, even if your goal was right. to kill Russians, then like, well, you right. got to deal with the army first, right? You have to exactly. deal yeah. with the military. Yeah, no, um, it's, it doesn't. Right, it's irrational. It's demented. Yeah, like I. Okay, well, so you're also you're saying that basically the Russians are now building fortifications where essentially the Ukrainians were supposed to build their fortifications. The Russians just kind of walked yeah. in and then built the line in a matter of weeks, where the right, well, right. Ukrainians or had days. You know, just recently, they, or days. Uh, yeah, where the well, Ukrainians I, yeah, had I months. Think what's happening? And, yeah. What's happening again is that there we have these very intense battles taking place at those two villages. You know, again, there's uh, Lipsy, and that's the that's the town that's that's basically on the road to Kharkov City. It's about halfway between the border and Kharkov City, and and the other one, Volchansk, is on a road that eventually makes its way down to Kupiansk, which is you know in the uh, southeastern part of Kharkov region, uh, where the Russians have uh, are. Are, um have been advancing recently um, so they're they're important for different reasons but it's it seems that the um that probably Zelensky himself has is is has decided that it, that Lipsy just cannot fall he's just he seems to be terrified he's certain that if Lipsy's fall if Lipsy falls then it's going to be cargo city and so he has taken, he's stripped away units from from the line, you know, all along the, the line to the south and brought them up. He's apparently seven brigades worth of units just for Lipsy alone. And that's, you know, so now actually the Ukrainians there, the Ukrainian forces outnumber the Russian forces by something like three to three or four to one. Um, from what I understand, the Russians are still advancing in spite of that. I mean, uh, <laughs> Yeah, this you know that wasn't so unusual in the earlier months of the war. The, in general, the Ukrainians um, outnumbered the Russians, but starting a few months ago or several months ago, I think the Russians have been outnumbering the Ukrainians on the front line, and that's one reason why you know we've seen a a real shift in fortunes, and we see the Russians advancing in different places. That's part of the reason. You know, that's only a part of it. But here, he's just concentrated a lot of forces at the expense of the line, you know, down south. Uh, just to hold on, but it, I, the problem is that like these are these are units that are stripped away from different uh, you know 
from different brigades down south and put together, they're not, they haven't worked together before. So it's just a very chaotic situation. So even though there are, you know, three or four Ukrainian soldiers to every one Russian soldier, they don't seem to be, you know, they are together putting up some formidable resistance. It's still not very effective. It's not nearly as effective as you would think, given the numbers, you know, because it's just they're very disorganized. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they also didn't prepare fortifications. A lot of these towns, like in the Donbass, you know, Avdiivka is, well, you know, the best known. Um, these were kind of, these were towns and cities, you know, that were turned into fortresses. It's going back in 2014, they just began, you know, actually just building fortifications within the town and, um, you know, and using apartment towers as, you know, uh, uh, like places that they can snipe from or otherwise, you know, fire upon Russian forces and basements as, as bunkers and so forth. And so these are very, you know, we, we, we saw how, how bloody and how destructive the battle, for example, for Avdeevka or Bakhmut, how, how mm. um, destructive it was, how difficult it was. Um, but apparently they never got around to doing the same thing in these little towns. So they, he's, he's, He's uh, moved a lot of these forces in there, but they don't really have a good place to hide, and they're not um, um, used to working with each other. So it's it's a very very bad situation for the Ukrainian forces there. And then, in spite of being outnumbered, the Russians continue to advance. But they, you know, they see that what the Ukrainians are doing, and they and they understand that okay, this may be a, a long battle if the if the Ukrainians are going to just keep on funneling forces to these two points, especially to Lipsy. Um, you know, it's probably, it's wise to have fortifications, have these trenches where we can, okay, we can um, pr- protect ourselves and then take a defensive posture, you know, and and just, um, you know, which is always actually the, the, the uh, defense is easier, you know, it's, again, mm-hmm. it's, it's less costly in terms of, of lives and equipment. So if we can't, continue to advance or you know if 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 they eventually through numbers bring the advance to a standstill we'll be ready to to defend and defend effectively and and uh, inflict very serious damage on the image enemy so whatever happens i think it's to the russians advantage there so when when you see how many people are in a brigade do you know so you said seven um, brigades worth like I'm wondering yeah, well, it's difficult to, is it, it's actually difficult to say in the case of Ukraine because well a lot of these brigades are under strength so I think like a you know a, a brigade at full strength is supposed to be something like four five thousand but uh, but it may just uh, be three thousand or something yeah I was just did you have any idea like what percentage of Ukraine's fighting force now has been sent to Lipsy to uh, you know to prevent this court call I, I think I know? heard that it like ten percent of all their forces to just these two little villages mm. you know which is okay so, so they have yeah it could be I think that's about right I, that's I heard ten percent and that's believable I mean that's a lot for for these two little you know they're not they're not very large towns. Right, um, but it's just, and I think again, it's very foolish, and and they're, the Ukrainians are paying the price in other parts of the line now. That's what I was going to say. I mean, it sounds to me like for the Russians, if they they are sending, yeah, being outnumbered three to one in a place like Lipsy, then you know the strategy for Russia would be okay, great. Well, we just occupy these guys here. We have you know right. air superiority. We okay, build the defense, right. and now we can push through but, in all the places right. that they weaken. They move the brigades. Right, from. we can hunker down here. We got the okay. We built the fortifications, and we can just yeah, just pin them down here. All these forces and and inflict casualties on you know firing upon them from our safe positions in these trenches. It makes yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to go back to um, the just what we started with in the beginning, talking about uh, Blinken and the U.S. greenlighting uh, strikes within Russia, um, because we could kind of say the the main shift here was that's more of a an open policy decision and maybe allowing larger, more powerful weapons to be used. Um, right. Has Russia drawn any red lines with? You know, saying like, okay, if there's an open policy decision from the U.S. green lighting this, or if they use attackums or high Mars, that now Russia is going to strike back. You know, strike a U.S. base in uh, uh, that's not in Ukraine. You know, strike a U.S. Yeah. base in Romania or in the Middle East. I mean, right? Uh, well, have I they said in anything? The case of, 
Right. Okay, in response to this, um, I don't know if the leadership has said anything. Well, I think Medvedev has, but he says something about everything, so I don't know what that, if that really means a whole lot. Um, um, but, you know, think back to just, it was just a couple of weeks ago, I think that it was the uh, the foreign minister of, uh, great, of, of the United Kingdom, uh, what's his name? Previous prime minister too, Cameron. 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 Cameron, yeah. right. Okay, he, yeah, he said just that, you know, that it was, um, you know, openly said that that uh, British weapons, in this case, that would be, for example, the storm shadow could be used to strike into Russia, that he, he thought that that was acceptable. And he was, um, his, well, the, the British ambassador was called in and given a dressing down. And it seemed like after that, they just, the British just sh shut up about it. So there must have been some very direct threat, you know, because actually it's quite interesting. It's just like, you know, that's a major news story. He said, okay, the British ambassador was called in. It wasn't mentioned, I think, in any British media, maybe just one, apparently just one story that it managed to slip through. There was just utter silence. Nothing was said about it. Is, you know, this is, again, this should be a major news story, major event. But clearly the, uh, the British government just did not want this covered, which I think means that the thing is, it was kind of a humiliating experience for them. I mean, they basically, they must have backed down, but they just didn't want that covered. You know, they didn't say, okay, you know, yeah, you know, F you, we're going to continue to do this. After that, there was silence. So I think, um, I think that the message that the Russians delivered there, you know, had its effect. Now, I don't know, you know, in the U.S., they're still, they're talking about it. Um, <clears throat> but from what I understand, it's, there, you know, Blinken's all for it, but there are people in the the Biden administration that don't want to go down that road. So it hasn't become policy yet, from my, you know, according to my understanding. And I I don't know if there's been any communications between, um, you know, the, the Russian leadership and the Americans. But it seems yeah. that it's something that they take very seriously. You know, if we look at what how they reacted to the the British proposal. Mm. Well, I, I hope it doesn't get green lighted and Blinken doesn't have his way. But it's, you know, once the drums of war start beating, it seems like it's really hard to turn off because we've seen it always. Right. We've always pushed the envelope a little bit by little bit by little bit. You know, right, right. We haven't right. seen any de escalatory measures from the U.S. And Zelensky's come out recently and said, said that no country by itself can defeat Russia. Basically, he's openly saying that the only thing that can save us is if we get other NATO has to join into this conflict. And it seems to be a real internal battle behind the scenes right now of how far oh. we commit. And if we do go right. straight in and it, because too many of the, the leadership in, in the West and in the United States, people like Blinken and, and uh, Biden, this is an existential war for them. They feel like they have to win right. because if they don't, then they're out of power. And um, and so that scares me. And it well, seems like right. they, they always seem to get their way eventually. It might take a little while or they just take mm -hmm. an inch by inch by inch until all of a sudden right. we're, we're, we've green lighted it. And then all of a sudden uh, Russia responds because we are using our missiles to strike some target within Russia. And Russia says, OK, we warned you. Now they hit a U.S. military base in Germany, a U.S. military base in Syria yeah. or, or wherever, you know, and right. then you know that. The media here and the war hawks and the war machine here, they're just going to beat the drums ever loud and said, see, I told you so. You know, Russia has attacked mm -hmm. America. It's full-blown war. World War Three begins. I can see that happening. And that's yeah, scary well, that there's not that yeah. many steps to get to that, yeah, that no, spot. I don't know. We're, that's right. We're kind of just kind of uh, balancing on the edge of the precipice here. It is it is very scary. Or just imagine we're walking down a path right on the edge you know, of a precipice. Um, yeah, one misstep and we could go over the edge. It, it is scary. Um, it's, yeah, you know, you're right. It just seems like it tends to ratchet upwards. It never seems to go down and, and all kinds of, um, yeah, sort of red lines that not that the Russians drew, but the, the West actually drew for ourselves, you know, for the, for itself, um, has, they've been crossed again and again, these red lines. Um, now either. One that's holding so far, I just find it interesting, is the uh, the Taurus missile. 
because I remember starting, it must be like a year ago, that there was this kind of constant the drumbeat of, you know, Germany's got to supply Taurus missiles. And there were even, you know, uh, um, pressure internationally within Germany to do it. And he's just thinking, well, we've seen Olaf Scholz cave in on everything else. The guy is completely spineless. <laughs> he's certainly going to cave in on this. But he seems to have developed a backbone over this. You know, we'll, we'll see. But he, but he has said a gu- no again and again and, and kind of just in a in um doesn't seem to be giving himself any kind of wiggle i mean he's just he's stating it just clearly and um you know without any sort of conditions um so maybe maybe you know there are eventually you get to some point where the escalation stops we just hope so um but uh yeah i I mean it's you have you're justified in, you know, your worries because that's not been the general um, course, you know, the of, of this war. It's just that, uh, yeah, it just seems it's not been the pattern that again and again, yeah, these, these uh, we resolved not to do something and then because we wanted to avoid escalation, then later we did it and we escalated it. And, mm. and it very well could happen again. And who knows how the Russians are going to respond, uh, but it's very dangerous. Yeah, it, it does seem like that Europe is kind of splitting or, or NATO, the West, in terms of how to proceed with this this conflict. We got, I think we have some people that, like you're saying, are getting cold feet um, and are wanting, wishing to de-escalate. I think, like you said, we, you know, Germany is starting to draw some firm lines um, in, in, in both conflicts, you know, saying that they would uh, arrest Netanyahu if he stepped foot um, in, uh, in Germany, um, also refusing to uh, they, they, they don't seem to want a green light. They said uh, the strikes into Russia withholding Taurus missiles. Um, so you have countries like the UK, yeah. US and France that seem to be pushing the escalatory uh, ladder. And then you have countries um, like, uh, you know, the Slovakia and um, Germany, even Italy that seem to be yeah, wanting to right. that. Yeah, that are like, this is this is crazy. This has gone too far. We don't right. want World War Three. I think the Serbian president is also talking about like, look, this is getting a little bit too close to reality. World War Three, um, we need to stop this now. So, right. do you yeah, see that happening? Serbia, it's not, right, it's not part of NATO or the EU, mm. but uh, yeah, uh, well, hu- yeah, Hungary, no, no, there course. obviously is resistance. That's that's right, um, and you know, I. <laughs> You know, again, you know, like you say, there's reason to be pessimistic because we've seen, you know, at least statements that that seem to be um, realistic and sensible. You know, okay, we stop here, and then you find out, no, we we don't stop here. We go on. So we're hearing it again, but you know, perhaps, perhaps, you know, there's just there there are points beyond which people these leaders will not go. Maybe they maybe the Russians have made it clear enough to them, you know, before that, okay, there will be real consequences that, you know, perhaps the message has gotten through, you know, time will only tell. Yeah, I, I hope so. But the problem is, is, is the U.S. The, the U.S. is the juggernaut that can kind of do what it wants. Right, yeah. And so, right, right. you know, and, and it just seems like America, we, we're realizing we're losing this war. I heard that that huge aid package, the 61 billion sent to Ukraine, is not going to last till November, that we're burning through it way too quickly. So right. I feel like right. the, the, well, part the, of this is that our our weapons are so expensive that these huge price tags actually doesn't really amount to that much weaponry, not as much as you would imagine. You know? mm. Yeah, I saw yeah, some I, I report. To, right, right. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I was saying I saw some report that uh, you know these 155 millimeter shells. These are kind of the standard being used in the in the war um, in Ukraine. It's what everybody needs more of. It seems like, but Russia. Is able to produce them at twenty five percent of the cost that we produce them is what I saw. <laughs> yeah, and no. yeah, and at three times the rate also. Well, right. even more than that, there was okay, but those are the cheap shells. There are mm. these GPS guided shells called Excaliburs, and apparently they cost a hundred thousand dollars each each artillery shell. And the thing is, well, okay, if it makes a direct hit each time, maybe it's worth it. But they don't work. That the you know the Russians. Um, have a way of know how to nullify the GPS function, and actually they, you know, the 
the Ukrainians don't want them. The, the U.S. agreed not to send any more of them. But $100,000 a shell. And then uh, um, I was just heard the other day that, you know, these Javelin um, anti-tank missiles, which we've been hearing about for a long time, they were supplied to Ukraine, you know, even well before the outbreak of the, the war in 2022. Um, they cost $200,000 each. I'd, I'd earlier heard, you know, that they were just very difficult to use. I mean, you have to have like a PhD in, in anti-tank weapon weaponry to use mm -hmm. you know that's obviously there's no such thing but it's just it's very complicated it takes requires a lot of training and even somebody who's well trained you know when you get into a combat situation you forget half the things that you thought you knew um so they're you know they rarely can they be used but when they do and they you know occasionally they do uh, make a direct hit destroy a tank well let's let's say that there is a convoy of uh, four armored vehicles you get the first one and they, with your javelin, okay, and you get ready to fire again. What happens? What happens is this two hundred thousand dollar missile. It goes and it hits the, the first tank that you already destroyed, and you fire a third one. It hits the first tank that you already destroyed because it has a heat seeking function on it, oh. and so it just so that's where the fire's <laughs> burning. And that's something that they've discovered. It's like, oops, you know, how many of these have they made? Two hundred thousand dollars a pop. Um, you know, that's that's just one example of, you know, the kind of weapons that they're getting. So it's just, again, it sounds 61 billion. Of course, that 61 billion is not all for weapons. I think it was like $14 billion for, for new weapons. Um, but yeah, they're probably just flying through that right away and, and getting a lot of, some things are helpful. A lot of things really are not very helpful. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, I don't want to dive too deep into the munition stuff, but it is, it's, it, it, we have talked extensively on how, uh, you know, this conflict has exposed just the weakness of the U.S. military industrial complex. We just can't produce things at scale and at, at, at efficiently at, at cost. Um, but I, I, I was I was just thinking is do you see any way that kind of these conflicts in Ukraine and in Gaza could potentially merge? Because I just had this thought that, OK, if let's let's have, do a hypothetical where. We green light using high Mars attack them to strike military targets deep within Russia. Now Russia has drawn a red line and said that, okay, now that means we have to strike base American bases because the US is doing this. Um, would it be possible that they would be striking bases? It seems like striking within Europe might be a little bit too scary for, you know, because it's, it doesn't seem like the theater of war if, if 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 a country like Germany gets struck, you know. But if the you could Russia target a base like in Syria and sort of, and then somehow these conflicts with with the Gaza and Israel and Ukraine and Russia somehow begin to merge, that there becomes this line, you know, that yeah, maybe that's a little bit too far out there, but it's just something yeah. that I was thinking like, is that possible? Because we have these two yeah, huge conflicts well, that are growing. I right. feel at some point, if they keep growing, they're going to connect and they're going to, right. there's going to be well, lines. Like they, right. right. It seems like the, connect, the, the connecting point is Iran, right? Because Iran has become a, you know, a, a close ally of Russia's. You know, I, I, I know they recently were, they were on the verge of, uh, of signing some sort of, defense treaty. I think they went ahead and did it. I just didn't hear anything about it afterwards. So I assume they, they did it. Um, but in any case, you know, Russia and Iran have been drawn increasingly close. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's just that that's, and then we have Russia is very cl closely, um, a, a very strong supporter and very deeply involved in Syria. So there is, you know, it's hard to, you know, you, you just presented one scenario it you know it doesn't seem likely, but you can't say it's impossible. You know maybe, um, you know maybe that's a way that they would do is sort of to, uh, you know, to achieve some kind of plausible deniability to go through a proxy. Um, but the proxy has got to be willing to do it, and it seems like it would have to be Iran would have to sign off on it because, um, you know, they they have all the connections with the militias around there. Um, and I don't know, they might have a reason to do it. You know, it seems right now they're trying to tamp things down. So it doesn't seem likely at the moment, but who knows? You know, it's just like these are two powder kegs and it's just, you're right, they could merge at one point because, you know, 
Russia and the U.S. are present in both theaters, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just hard to see. You know, there's just war is full of um, uh, uncertainty. You know, there are all kinds of outcomes that that you know we can't even really conceive of right now. But there there could we could you know how things change just quickly it, it erupts in directions that that we just that nobody's able to forecast. And who knows? Yeah, I mean, you just have to say that there's a potential for that because they are, you know, they are these two superpowers, you know, the Russia, two great powers, Russia and the U.S., are deeply involved in in both regions, you know, are present in both regions. And and they're um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy enough to just have one of these conflicts going on. The fact that we got both going on and they're both kind of just growing escalating is mm -hmm. should terrify people more than it is i feel like too many right. people are, are just sort of just you know blind ignorant you know blissfully ignorant about what's happening in both of these uh -huh. regions yeah let the, i don't know i i hope it doesn't happen uh that they're that, that these become into one mega war but i can see it potentially happening um uh, i want to ask you a little bit about Zelensky. um well, what's his current state right now? Is he? Is it looking like that he might be losing his grip on power? I hear he's becoming increasingly panicked and yelling at his generals. You know, it looks yeah. looking more dire for him. And then also Putin and Russia stated that, well, Zelensky is no longer the legitimate leader because his term expired on the 20th since the 21st of May. He He's technically not in charge. So they... And Russia says they're open to negotiations, but they need to negotiate. They don't know who to negotiate with because they can, Zelensky has signed into law that he won't negotiate. And Russia is right. saying that Zelensky isn't even a legitimate leader anymore. Right. Um, so what, what's right. what's going on with that? You know, do you think he's going to be out yeah. or? <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't look bad for him. I, you know, I would just say that. Yeah, going against him. If, yeah, it does seem like he he is growing increasingly paranoid, right? There are these stories about him shouting at his generals and, and accusing them of lying to him. You know, that's a kind of a classic sign of paranoia, and and then this decision to you know strip units from the line and send them up to Lipsy, it it seems to me deeply irrational, and I, it appears that 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 was Zelensky's decision. I mean, it's just his own fears. He's just afraid that Kharkov is falling, but it's not a rational military decision. So it just, um, um, and, you know, his his generals you know, cannot be happy with it. You know, the, the soldiers, you know, again, we talked about it, there's just increasing rumblings. In the, um, and, you know, as things go from bad to worse on the line, his, you know, a lot of people are going to be looking for scapegoats. And the number one scapegoat is Zelensky. I think you have to say this, especially vulnerable now that he is not the elected um, president, you know, or at least you could argue that. Um, and then um, it seems that, yeah, just in general, the population is has really turned against the Ukrainian people, have really turned against this war. They do not want to fight it. I mean, that just seems crystal clear. We've all seen the videos, talked about them really, of the, the empty cities. But just, I think just, Recently, probably earlier today, the um, someone in the Ukrainian Rada uh, proposed using a kind of a hostage um, arrangement to to make sure that no one you know flees, uh, evades their, their their duties, evades conscription. So what this would mean is like if you have you know for every uh, every man of um, who is meets the conditions for conscription? There's it would be an appointed hostage, you know, a, you know, somebody, another member of the family, you know, for example, an uncle or whatever. If, if he if he runs off, then you grab the uncle and send him to the front line. You know, this is the idea. But this, you know, this is it has to be born of desperation and of awareness that you know you your people are not supporting this war. And I just it seems to me, I mean, things can. Um, this just can't go on for too long. I mean, if there's a, a, a total lack of popular support at some point, you know, that's going to manifest itself in some sort of, you know, open rebellion. It just seems like it has to. You know, the more you send these people, you give them guns, these people who don't want to fight your war, you give them guns and send them to the, the, the front lines, 
you know, the the likelihood that there's they're going to turn around and point those guns back at the people who sent them there. It it seems like that's that likelihood is just going to grow and grow. And one day we're going to see some, you know, open rebellion in Ukraine. I, Do you, you think know, who knows when? But it doesn't seem like it can go on for that much longer. I mean, things can't continue as they are. Uh, Zelensky won't be able to, you know, maintain his control for too much longer. You know, I might be surprised. Well, you know, the one thing that he does have going for him is the U.S. support um, that might, you know, carry him for a while. But the the U.S. may decide that, uh, you know, to cut their losses. They've done that before. Um, like they did that, mm -hmm. I guess, I think it was Diem in, in, in Vietnam. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I'll just say, like, I, I'd say on the outside, you'll make it another four months or something. <laughs> I usually don't make predictions, but it just looks pretty bad for I, so, so do you think that's going I'd to be, be the like if it goes on longer? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I can see that happening too. So do you think that's going to be the likely end of this Ukraine war that will actually be kind of an open revolt from the Ukrainian people that said that this is, this is, we've had enough, you know, you're taking our family members hostage. Most people that we know, uh, everybody knows somebody that's probably died in the war. I heard something that half yeah. Ukrainians are suffering from PTSD. Um, because it just the, the losses have been so horrific um, and you're scared of your own government, you're scared of the Russians, you're scared, you know, it's just, you can't keep people living in fear for that long without having something break. Um, so yeah. do you think I that's think how this... I think depend entirely on fear. You know, you can for a while, but, but um, you know, every regime, it, it needs, you need to have some kind of real commitment. You know, you need to have convinced a certain, you know, the substantial part of the population that you're legitimate. And I think, yeah, they may be losing that. Like the people who actually regard the government as legitimate, it's got to be pretty small. It's just the ultra nationalists now. Well, I mean, yeah, you, I, you're you know, saying. I heard this one anecdote. I don't know if he um, actually of uh, um, you know one of these press gang gangs. You know the the, the 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 those teams of you know toughs that go out on the streets and just find young men and grab them, throw them into van vans. You know, one of these uh, teams was uh tried to grab a guy the guy had a grenade he actually um pulled a bin killed himself and then blew off the legs of one of the recruiters oh my goodness um yeah and apparently it's all on it's you know it's all on video you can see it's i wouldn't recommend it seeing it but it's it's out there and that that's just you know that's an extreme example but that is reflective of something you know that's you know obviously very few people are going to do that, but even if some few individuals are going that far, and there are others that are <clears throat> risking their lives, you know, they're, I guess, people drown in the river, um, attempting the crossing over to, let's say, Moldova or Romania. It happens all the time now. You know, people are willing to risk their lives and sometimes lose them, try to evade this conscription. That it just gives you a sense of the depth of, of, uh, of opposition, you know, to the current government. Yeah, so if Zelensky's popularity is clearly plummeting, you know, nobody wants to fight this, or very few people want to fight this war anymore, and they're being forced to, does that mean that also that the the population within Ukraine is turning against the U.S. just de facto because they well, feel like, well, yeah. the only reason this war is continuing is because of the U.S.'s support. They're pushing Zelensky right. to do this. We're giving him more money. We say you got to yeah. keep fighting. We send people like Lindsey Graham that says you got to conscript more. You got to get more of yeah, your, men, yeah, you know, yeah. your 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 sons and your your men. You know, send them out to to die uh, for 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 what? <laughs> I mean, they they got to be starting to wonder that. Um, so yeah, you, do you would think so. I yeah, I don't know if it's. I know to some extent. Yeah, there are certainly are growing complaints directed at the West. Um, those, you know, often it takes the form of you didn't give us enough support. Well, that's kind of but, what comes from Zelensky, yeah. right? Zelensky seems yeah, to be also right. lashing out every now and then. He'll yeah. say, thank you so much for the support. But then he you right. clearly see he has two uh, he's split personalities. And he's like, you guys are screwing us. At the same time, he tells yeah. them that, too. Like, thank you. Yeah. But well, he's, always, he didn't a, do enough. he's always hoping for more and demanding more. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I don't think he really understands. you. I don't think the guy has a very good grasp on reality. I don't think he understands that it's not just a, like a lack of will in the U.S., but there is a lack of capability. I mean, that's that there are limits to American power. I think for a lot of people around the world, you know, they think of America, they think of America, you know, like 50 years ago, that that seemed to be, you know, just this colossus with no limits to its power. 
Um, you know, of course, that America actually lost in Vietnam, so there obviously were limits to its power. Um, but still, you know, they, they, they think that, it, but the under, you know, I guess the story that was told after the Vietnam War, and there's some truth to it, it's just it was a, a loss of will. We engaged in a war that was not existential for us. We could have won it, but, um, but at great cost and at greater cost than, you know, we were willing to pay. Um, 50,000 dead was, was plenty. Um, the, um, but yeah, but, you know, you have it, all around the world, I think there's still people that just kind of uh, believe, don't understand how things have shifted and how the, the balance of power shifted. The U.S. remains a very powerful country, but it's not, it's no longer the hyperpower, it's no longer the, um, the the colossus without peer you know it's there there clearly are limits to its power and they've been and we're coming up against those limits now i mean we're seeing them in this war they they're running out of those weapons that again as we pointed out are are not it turn out not to be quite as effective as they were um made out to be but uh, yes, still people believe in it. So they, you know, they, they have trouble understanding. There've been people like Zelensky say that when they're not getting, you know, things aren't going the right way. It just must be that somebody is stabbing him in the back. Somebody's not, you know, working hard enough. They just don't understand that, you know, that maybe they miscalculated. <laughs> right. Well, I think the problem is just as they come to that realization, I think they get increasingly fanatical and panic because they, they can't come to terms with that idea that somehow the U.S. power is limited and that, you know, I just think, I don't know if you just saw recently, uh, Biden went out and said that the U.S. is the only superpower in the world. He said that yeah. just yesterday, you know, like this is the, 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 yeah. the fantasy realm that they live in. So right. I j it just, it doesn't make me feel good about our options for de-escalate, de-escalation. Yeah. The only thing that right. I can, the, the best case scenario that I feel like could happen is that what we said earlier is where uh, the, the the people within Ukraine revolt and rise up, throw out throw out Zelensky and push out the U.S. government and say, and say this is we've had enough. This is the end. Because then it becomes very difficult for the U.S. to come and say, no, come on, keep on fighting, guys. We've got to keep this going. Yeah. If, if, if it's clear right. that the people have, have revolted um, and right. then they just might have to walk away with the tail between their legs. And then we'll go try yeah. to start war, a war with China right. or Iran, you know. Um, yeah. Well, it's a, you know, yeah, they're, that's right. You can say they're kind of, they're different cults here. You know, one, there's the ultra-nationalist cult within Ukraine. That's the problem. It's not just Zelensky. Um, you know, it is the, um, you know, Azov, Kraken, the right sector. Uh, you know, I think these are the people that are, um, that, that these uh, conscription teams draw from, you know, that it just think it's a duty. They don't care, you know, what you think. You, you know, if you got to die, you got to die. We're sending you to the front. Um, those people still have a lot of power, you know. They've got. Um, so, you know, if we if Zelensky goes, the question is, who takes over? It could be somebody even worse. That's the danger, you know. There's, somebody who is, you know, more openly a nationalist and very closely allied to these, you know, the the, the nationalist uh, military formations. But then we have in the, the West, we have the cult of, uh, let's say, Western exceptionalism, Western hegemony, which I think is a real, it, it really is a cult too. I mean, it's just, it's a, uh, it's an irrational belief that, that explains a lot of the behavior of the elites that we see there. Um, it was, you know, rarely is it stated openly, but uh, good old Boris Johnson stated for us, I think just a couple of weeks ago, where he said that, you know, this is an existential war. This is um, Western hegemony, you know, is on the line. Yeah, to paraphrase him, he said it openly, Western hegemony, you know, that's what this is all about. And so, and that's, that is what it's all about. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing, you know, it's so, you're right. You know, this is something that, uh, that these people believe in deeply and they have trouble conceiving of a, a world where they're not the hegemons, you know, it's just for them, that's just a horrifying alternative and they can only see kind of a, a dark abyss on the other side. So, um, you, you know, 
yeah, maybe, you know, when, when it comes down to it, when it becomes clear, you know, let's say that the, the Russian army, you know, marching towards Kiev or something, or they take uh, the city of Kharkov, um, when that happens, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be scary, you know, because it's going to be, um, they're either going to say, okay, we just got to give up on hegemony you know that's that was a great dream and, and walk away from it or no you know we can't risk we we've got to go all the way you know we've got to go nuclear or fight the russians mm -hmm. directly or um and i i don't have a clear answer as to what's going to go on there it's conceivable that there you know there are seem there do seem to be some uh more realistic you know voices out there and maybe those people will win the day in the end, you know, maybe they will convince the crazies, you know, just like we always have these crazies that are been itching for war with Iran for the last 20 years. And they, they push and sometimes they get real close, but then there are these other people that you don't hear so much from, but they are in places like the state department, incredibly and the Pentagon and they maybe more in the Pentagon than the state department, you know, say, Hey, you know, it just doesn't add up. We, you know, we just don't have the guns to do this or, you know, or we're just too vulnerable to to uh, Iranian missiles. And the same thing, you can see the same thing maybe happening, you know, when push comes to shove um, in connection with Ukraine. It's just when they say, OK, you know, the, all the crazy say we're, we're going in and then the people and the, the generals the same generals and we hope there are enough of them and the pentagon and military analysts say no you're not we just don't have the guns to do this we're outgunned well, here well if biden know. just but i mean it's biden as commander chief couldn't he override his generals yeah I mean, because it seems well, like that's can. what's scary i mean yeah well that's the thing is he can but um but yeah it's just we just hope that he can you know if he's told just outright, you do this, Biden, we're going to lose, mm -hmm. and that's that's even worse than not doing it. He you know, can't. You know, you maybe he can understand that. I yeah, don't think well. so. I don't know. I mean, this is this. It seems like this Ukraine <laughs> project know, I, is something. Yeah, right. He, he's in too deep, and you know, we kind of it's just like we're falling for like the sunk fallacy, uh, sunk cost fallacy. I feel like we just keep on, yeah, you know, putting more and more in, and then we just feel like we're in too deep, and we just get in deeper right. and deeper. You know, because yeah. I also saw that, you know, Putin is has said that he's open to a ceasefire on the current lines now and to enter negotiations. But they're just we, we won't negotiate, you know, and I, I, we had to, like I said, there's been so many opportunities where we've scuttled peace agreements. You know, we've uh, we, we've reneged on Minsk one and Minsk two. Yeah. Um, and we, we and, and Blinken hasn't talked once to Lavrov. You know, Biden yeah, will right, talk to right. Putin. So there's no willingness to communicate, even though the Russians have said that even right now, where we're clearly winning, if you guys want to start talking, yeah. we can talk about drawing this line where it is now. Um, and of course, crickets from yeah. uh, from the White House, from from, you know, the West. Is, is that yeah. right? Is my information yeah, correct? You know, I've, I've heard that. I actually kind of find it difficult to believe that he would actually consider first of all ceasefire because i think the russians have said plainly that i know lavrov has said recently um you no know, you know if we go enter into negotiations we continue fighting because we're not going to be tricked again they say you know back in um it was march april of uh, 2022 we actually withdrew troops from the kiev era area as a you know a goodwill gesture because you you know that was something that you asked of us and then and then you reneged on your agreement, you know. So, uh, yeah, we don't, you know, we don't believe you until you, you know, you, you can actually demonstrate and, you you know, you sign on the dotted line and, and back it up in some sort of um, verifiable way. Um, yeah, we are going to keep on fighting until that happens. You know, no, no temporary I, I just fires. can't see. I can't see Biden doing that. His ego is too big. Yeah. You know, he can't admit yeah. that well, he messed. See, that's the... part of the problem. It's just that it's just so hard to. You know, the U.S. has has been used to being again. It had that that unipolar moment, and it was it could just dictate terms, or or it, or it thought it could anyway, and and in many cases it could. It wasn't even then, you know, its uh, its power was not unconstrained. That's just not possible. But it, it was, it seemed like it was unconstrained. You know, it seemed there, there was no real rival. Um, and then to finally, 
you know, to, to say, okay, yeah, we got to negotiate with the Russians. In a way, that's to step down and to admit that you you no longer are, you know, the the uh, the sole superpower. And obviously, that's what you should do. Is you have to be realistic. But it's just something that these people find very hard to do. And it's just they find it humiliating. They don't want to go down. You know, it's sort of like we... Uh, let somebody else do that. It's just sort of like, you know, when the, the U.S. gets involved in a war like Vietnam or Afghanistan, that clearly at some point the leaders actually realize this was a mistake. We shouldn't have done it. But nobody wants to be caught holding the bag. Nobody wants to be the one that actually, um, you know, signs the peace treaty and re and uh, retreats. It looks bad. You know, Biden was made to look bad, you know, I, at the end of the Afghanistan war, you know, though it did have to end. And so this is similar, you know, you don't want to be the one you, you'll be accused, you know, there will be people in the, you know, in the nationalist right in the U.S. who will attack him as being weak if he, if he, you know, offers to negotiate. There's always this, you know, there's always that, uh, that, that desire, that need to, to appear tough, to, you know, to thump your chest. And, um, well, because of uh, just... You know, so our leaders' egos and you know, the, the the need to protect them, we're just going to have to have more Ukrainians die for longer because then right. it, a, a peace, a quick peace negotiation is can be made if we're willing to negotiate and enter these talks, but we are not because Biden doesn't want to be made yeah. to look weak. He doesn't right. want another, you know, admit that he was wrong. Um, and right. so now well, more people yeah, will there's die. That. I mean, there's. There's that. And then, but there is a larger question of Western hegemony. So it's not just the U.S., it's the entire Western establishment is really afraid of that moment. And a lot of them are just fighting. It's just like we can't, you know, let go of Western hegemony. And that's afraid that the moment they do that, you know, they stop and say, okay, yeah, this war was a mistake. Let's negotiate with the Russians. No, I, that's just I don't understand a, for Western The way Europe, they look well, at it, right. But, but, but what was, what's so great about being, you know, being a little vassal to the united states it doesn't right. seem to be that awesome why, why not do you know like things great good stuff is coming out of russia and china why not be friends with them and be, fr be friends right. with everybody you know like i don't right, understand right, right. why yeah western europe cares and i think a lot of western european countries are realizing that countries like italy uh -huh. countries like spain you know they they uh -huh. are starting to be like or, or countries like hungary they're like hey the world's changing what what is the u.s doing they just give us headaches and they just push us around, you know, I, I don't see, they're probably start people, countries are starting to realize, and I think we'll start to see more and more people fracture away from, split off from the United States and the U.S. become increasingly isolated as this goes on. Um, but it's just such a shame that we're going, we won't, won't go for peace, that more Ukrainians are going to have to die, and that basically what's going to happen is either they're going to have a, enough Ukrainians will die, that there will be revolt, uh, you know, in, in Ukraine that could hopefully push out the U.S. influence and NATO influence, or we just march our way to slowly to World War III. That seems to be the two paths we go down because we don't want to enter in negotiations. Uh -huh. You know, maybe I'm yeah. wrong. You know, maybe we'll get to a point where we're just like, <laughs> right. okay, but that, that sunk cost fallacy and that, and the egos of our, yeah. you know, of our president or our White House or administration just don't seem to allow for it. I just don't see it happening that we can enter into any type of peace talk. Yeah, well, there doesn't seem to be a chance of it now. You know, nothing that actually kind of takes the Russians and their concerns seriously. That's the whole problem. That's why this war started. You know, the Russians actually laid out their concerns and said, this is, you know, hey, this is, you know, this is uh, deeply concerns us. You know, we consider mm -hmm. this a serious threat. You know, we must talk about this, you know. We do have some demands, and, and one of them, of course, the, the main one was neutrality for Ukraine. Mm. And that's one, you know, that's a demand that they've consistently rejected, and they continue to reject. Even when they talk about freezes and ceasefires and so forth, they always say, but then, of course, afterwards, um, uh, Ukraine will be, will uh, enter NATO. Mm. And so, no matter what, they're not actually considering or shown any willingness to consider the, the really the first requirement, the first concern of the Russians, and that is, you know, the status of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, again, it's just like, yeah, you know, we can say there's 
you know, why not have neutrality? You think about it like during the, the Cold War these and, and earlier, I mean, the, the neutral countries were the most prosperous countries. Neutral countries did very well. You know, we, Switzerland, Sweden, you know, and Finland to a great extent and Austria too. You know, these all were to varying degrees neutral. And they, these were not, you know, uh, backwards countries. These were very prosperous, very successful countries. What is wrong with being neutral? I mean, that's actually, there's, that's a, that ought to be, you know, a really um, sought after status, you would think so. Um, I would love it if America yeah, could be neutral. <laughs> yeah, well, America that's, that's can't what be we neutral. were, what right. we were founded right. yeah, on neutrality. Know, right, that right, was the original. Right. Yeah, the, George right. Washington, well, right there, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know? right, right, right. Yeah, that's right. These are not un-American ideas, exactly. You can just say that the original American idea has been hijacked by, you know, by this uh, uh, vision of the American empire. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, you know, it just what's also just so absurd is that the West plays these games that 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 okay, yeah, we want peace. We want so they'll have these peace summits, but you know, who's never invited the peace summit? Is Russia yeah. so just a bunch right, of just right, Zelensky right, yeah. and a bunch right, of and, right. and and Biden talking about oh yes we need to get Crimea back and we need to do this no yeah, right. there's no real yeah, effort yeah. at negotiation they right. just yeah that's, maybe right, they can... right. that's that's absurd that's a perfect example right I mean if you're going to have you know if you want to have negotiations or even you know like talks leading to negotiations or something you have to involve the Russians you have to address the concerns you know otherwise you're not you're, you know you're just you're delivering ultimatums that's what it, what's going on. You know, Switzerland pretend, you know, they're they're hosting the, the upcoming peace conference, so-called peace conference, right? And um, they're pretending to be a neutral country, but they're they're not. And, the, you know, the Russians have been pointing out that, out that that fact, you know, I've been. Um, but, yeah, they're they're holding this conference, which is essentially is just uh, it's Zelensky's peace pr proposal, which is that uh essentially just demanding total surrender from the Russians. They're supposed to surrender, raise the white flag, and then and cede all the lands, including Crimea, and and then hand over their looters, leaders, including Putin, uh, for war crimes trials and pay, you know, trillions of dollars in war reparations. And so it's just, you know, it's an absurd ultimatum that's being delivered by the losing party. You know, what chance that this is... What chance does this have of succeeding? You know, absolutely zero. It's the thing's a total farce. And the, the Russians were invited by the Swiss who were pretending to be neutral to say, okay, you can come, but apparently they can't actually take part in any of the sessions. They just have to wait there in the end and then receive the ultimatum. That's what what it's all about. So that's 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 all that's happening. You know, that's the you know, all this talk about everything from, you know, the so-called Zelensky's peace plan to uh, a frozen line, whatever. These are all things that are just going to be imposed, but as they're not addressing the Russian concerns, you know, that's nobody's doing that. Nobody's stopping and thinking they're coming or drawing up with, you know, their, their peace proposals or whatever ways of entering. But in, in no case do they actually stop and say, well, what is it that the Russians want? We'll just We'll just do this and the Russians will accept it. There's still a refusal to, you know, regard them as equals and as having legitimate concerns of their own. You know, that's why the war started and that's why the war is is going on. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. You're getting me all worked up on Ukraine next week. Uh, yeah. uh, on Wednesday, we can get worked up on uh, Rafa and uh, what's happening in the then, Middle then East. Then we have our happy Friday, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. We'll try. We'll try our happy Maybe well, maybe a glass of bourbon each or whatever. Okay, yeah, we'll have to drink a lot to get happy for this one, I think. Okay, all right, thanks a lot, Dad. Okay.